Welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Uh, today we have Caroline Euler from MIT talk about uh, a very important and uh, current topic, causal inference in the light of drug repurposing for SARS, uh, so for coronavirus. Um, she will stop uh, during the talk to take some questions. So please uh, submit your questions via Q&A. Also after the talk, we will uh, allow for some uh, more questions. All right, thank you all uh, for joining. Uh, I will now switch over to Caroline. Caroline, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. So let me open my slides. And here we go. And okay. So if I don't hear anything, then my slides are now showing up and you see a pointer. Yes. Um, perfect, great. So thank you um, particular to the organizers for putting together this um, great lecture series and for inviting me to speak here. Um, so I thought I would uh, talk about causal inference and put it into the light of drug repurposing for COVID-19 given the current situation. Um, so for me, what has been or what has really excited me to work on causality since the beginning is the availability of interventional data that is really starting to become available in many different fields. Um, think of, you know, the advertisement industry, think of um, online education and where I come from, I'm mainly interested in genomics um, kinds of applications um, where more and more interventional data is really becoming available. And so that is, of course, uh, unique for causality, not just to test um, algorithms, but also um, to ask completely new questions that maybe weren't there before. Um, so if you think of uh, causal inference, um, traditionally it has really been centered around um, observational data and randomized control trials have usually been considered unpractical, unethical or just super, super expensive. And I really think that is changing in many different areas. And as I said, so I'm particularly interested in genomics. Um, here, what we've seen over the last years is that high throughput observational and interventional data is really becoming available even at the single cell level. And let me just talk about two different kinds of um, data sets. Um, one of them is on the expression side. So if I talk about single cell expression data, what I mean is humans have 20,000 genes. So the observations live in 20,000 dimensional space. Um, and every observation is a single cell. So it's the expression of every gene in single cells. Now, while, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago or so, these data sets had maybe a hundred samples. Nowadays, they have like a hundred thousand to a million. Okay, so these are data matrices of size 20,000 times a hundred thousand to a million. Um, and not only can you observe these single cells, but you can also intervene on any one of the genes you like. Um, so you have this 20,000 20, genes, right? So um, through the development of um, the CRISPR-Cas system, you can actually knock out different genes or you can also overexpress them um, in a knockout or just setting the expression to zero because you're really um, removing the gene. Okay, so you can intervene on any of the genes, even combinations of genes, and you can see what happens to the cells. So how does the expression change? So that's one type of interventional data that are becoming you know, more and more available. Um, the, and they're also freely available and I'll show you some of them afterwards. Um, the other type of experiments are more imaging based or, or actually also um, expression based, but it's a very different kind of intervention. These are drug interventions and that's why those are probably very interesting right now, um, given that you know, there's a big search going on, right, for finding drugs for repurposing against SARS-CoV-2. So there are these very, very large scale screens and I'll talk about them later in the talk, where you have you know, many, many different drugs, um, which are just applied to different kinds of cell types. And you get to see the effect of this drug on the cell type, either by this image where each one of these dots here is a single cell and you get to observe different kinds of protein levels or also again expression. Okay, so where you apply a drug and you get to observe what happens to the cell in terms of its expression. So these are just two um, of the, you know, different kinds of data, interventional data sets that are available in genomics, which I think really lead to new questions, but also new, really new opportunities for actually testing different kinds of causal inference algorithms. 
And so what are the kinds of questions I want to be talking about? Um, so I'll talk about causal transportability questions. Um, in the first part, so this is more about the knockout experiments. Um, so if you think about knockout experiments and drug experiments, in terms of interventions, they're actually quite different. So a knockout experiment, you could see it as, you know, not as an intervention on a particular node or a subset of few nodes, and they're mostly known. Okay, so if I intervene on node A, on gene A, um, then usually I will actually get an intervention on gene A, and I might also get some off-target effects, but these are not too many. Um, and um, yeah, so, so, and also you can do, as I said, combinations of interventions, but you cannot do too many because then a cell usually dies if you do too many interventions at the same time. Okay, so see this as having interventions on few nodes, few well-defined nodes, okay? So now, of course, as I said, you know, we have 20,000 genes um, in human cells, right? So if you want to understand all, say, different kinds of effects of knockouts on two genes at the same time, that's 20,000 choose two experiments. So that's quite large, right? Maybe you also want to do 20,000 choose three. So you're definitely not going to be able to do that. So one transportability question is, well, can we given some interventional data, right, say on gene 1, gene 10, gene 3 and 5 together, etc., can you then predict the effect of interventions that you have not yet seen? Okay, so here you see here I have an intervention on one gene, I have some data like this, different kinds of genes, I want to be able to predict the effect of an intervention on a different gene. So that's I would call this a causal transportability question, but this is a transportability from one intervention to an unknown other intervention. Okay, so, and to do this, how we'll approach this is actually to learn. So given the data that you have, so observational and interventional data, um, we'll try to learn the underlying causal graph. And from this causal graph, you can then try to learn, uh, to read off the effect of an unseen intervention. So that's one form of transporting. So transporting from some interventions to an unseen intervention. Um, now, if you think of drugs, as I said, they're very different, namely drugs, they usually have, so they ha are in interventions on many different targets at the same time, and these targets are mostly unknown. Okay, so very different to knockouts, where it's few targets mostly known, drugs have many targets mostly unknown. Okay. And so here I'll be looking at a different kind of, or actually this is, so traditionally, if someone says a causal transportability question, this is what they mean. Um, so what I'll be looking at is this more, maybe more traditional causal transportability question. When I look at, you know, I look at a particular drug, I know its effect on one cell type, and I want to predict what is its effect on a different cell type. Okay, so same drug, so that's what I'm showing here with these arrows. So a drug has many different targets, um, and I'm looking at this drug, and I try to predict it on a different cell type here shown in blue. Okay, so that's uh, this question. I want to transport um, same intervention, but between different environments or between different cell types. Okay, and so how uh, we're going to approach this problem is um, using autoencoders, and you'll see how we'll do this. Um, so why is this interesting um, from the perspective of SARS-CoV-2? Well, as I said, you know, there are these big, um, big uh, drug screens um, and humans have, you know, a couple of hundred different cell types. Now, obviously, not every drug has been tested on every cell type, but drugs have very different effects on different cell types. Now, for a particular disease, you might actually care about a particular cell type, right? So, for example, if you're thinking of SARS-CoV-2, well, it affects our upper respiratory tract, particular epithelial cells in there. So what you really want to know is what is the effect of all these drugs on these particular cell types, right? In order to then um, anti-correlate them with the effect of the disease and try to figure out drugs that actually would work well or are candidates um, to map, to move um, the disease state back more towards the normal state. Um, so that's where the application will come in. Okay, so I'll talk about these very two very different transportability questions. Um, and I'll start with this one up here, which is more um, motivated by these uh, knockout experiments. Okay, so as I said, so I'll be looking at this problem here from a causal network model perspective. Um, whereas down here, I'm actually not going to use graphs in order to solve this transportability problem. 
Okay, so up here, so I'll take this very standard um, framework that was already developed in the 1920s of structural equation models um, by Sewell Wright. I think everyone here is familiar with this. So um, if I don't have any latent variables, we will talk about latent variables briefly afterwards. If I don't have any, I will represent the causal relationships by a directed acyclic graph. Every node is associated to a random variable and every node is just some function of its parents and some noise. Okay, now important for um, genomics applications, I'm going to use this non-parametric framework. So I'm not making any assumptions on these functions f, so they might be non-linear. I'm not making any assumptions on the noise, so they might in particular be non-Gaussian. Okay, I'm really using this particular framework here. Now, um, I want to reason about interventions. Um, so I'm going to use um, this framework that was already introduced by Frederick Eberhardt on different kinds of, on reasoning about different kinds of interventions. In particular, hard interventions are a very, or a particular kind of intervention. Um, think of a gene knockout experiment. This would fall in here. So a hard intervention, I'm taking a particular node and I'm just, um, I'm just putting it, uh, let's think about the easiest setting first. Set, say I'm just setting it to a particular constant. So for example, for a knockout experiment, I'm just setting it to zero. I could also set it to some random value. The important thing in a hard intervention is that the, um, the value of x2 does not depend on the parents anymore. Okay, I'm actually cutting off this edge here. I'm cutting off all of the incoming edges. So it's a very invasive intervention, right? If you think of a knockout experiment where I'm just taking a gene and I'm setting its value to zero, it doesn't matter anymore what my parents do, right? There is no more effect on me. Actually, this gene is not there anymore. So it's just, its expression value is zero. So I'm really changing the graph structure. Uh, soft interventions are everything else. I'm not changing the graph structure, but I am changing how node X1 acts on X2 and I'm also changing, or I could be changing the noise. Okay, so this is everything else. So these are the less invasive interventions. If you want to think about something like a gene um, overexpression experiment, we'll probably fall in here. Okay, so um, as I said, so there has been a lot of research in terms of observational um, setting for um, learning these graphs and, and of course other questions of course, as, of course as well. What I want to be thinking about is what can be done with interventional data. And um, I will want to look at approaches that learn this graph um, from a mix of observational data and interventional data as well. Okay, so where are we? So how do these approaches usually work? Okay, so we know that if you have a causal model, um, a causal model implies certain conditional independence relations through the Markov property, right? So a particular missing edge corresponds to a particular conditional independence relation, which I will write like this, and you'll see later on why I want to write it like this. It corresponds to conditional independence relation where a node is independent of another node um, give, when there is no, no edge between them, given everyone before um, in the graph. Okay, so given all of the ancestors in the graph. Now, of course, if you want to learn the graph, you have to go the other way around, right? So I don't know the graph, but what I can estimate are these different kinds of conditional independence relations. I can estimate them from data. And so from this, I want to learn the graph. Now, if you don't have any other assumptions on the model or on the noise, um, this is not identifiable. In fact, there are different kinds of graphs that correspond to the same conditional independence relations, and these are known as Markov equivalence classes. Okay, so for example, if you just have observational data, of course, you cannot tell, and you don't have any other assumptions, like non-Gaussianity, non-linearity, etc. You cannot tell whether x causes y or y causes x. You'll just see that they're correlated. Now, of course, the question is now you have interventional data, right? So you have interventional data, so the question is, can you now say more? Um, so say you have an intervention on node X. Well, then of course, you know, if I intervene on X, then the distribution of Y changes in this graph. But if you intervene on X here, the distribution of Y doesn't change, right? So you should expect that the interventional equivalence classes are finer um, than these equivalence classes. And they're known as interventional Markov equivalence classes. And they have actually been characterized. Okay, so they have been characterized first um, for hard interventions here in this paper by Hauser and Grunemann. And then what we showed in this paper here is that in fact, it doesn't matter whether the interventions are hard or soft. So whether you have these very invasive interventions or actually just general soft interventions, in terms of identifiability, you just get the same, okay? So you're actually not losing anything um, with soft interventions, which is important for genomics. 
Um, people were doing hard interventions, thinking that they would actually get more information about the underlying gene regulatory network. Um, what is the advantage of soft interventions? Well, as I said, you know, if you do too many hard interventions in one cell, the cell dies. Um, in particular, usually if you knock out more than 10 genes or so, if they're not well um, chosen, then the cell will die. But you can do an overexpression experiment where, you're not, where you overexpress many more genes and the cell is still alive. So you can actually study um, what happens with these you know, higher order interventions when you do soft interventions. Okay, so this is known. Um, so it is at least known if the sample size goes to infinity, what can I hope to learn? Okay, so what can I hope to identify? These are these, ident these interventional Markov equivalence classes. So then the next question, once we know what we can identify, the next question is, you know, can we come up with algorithms to actually do this, right? Can we come up with algorithms that take in data, which is observational and interventional, and then output the interventional Markov equivalence class? So it just learns all of the causal relationships that we can possibly learn from this data. Okay, so for that, let me just very briefly give an overview on what is available in terms of um, just causal structure discovery from observational data. Um, so here the picture is actually very nice. So this is without any interventions. Um, and for now, without any latent variables, I'll talk briefly about what is available there as well. Okay, so just observational data, everything observed. Um, so the picture is actually very nice because you can just think of two classes of algorithms, all algorithms that are available are either in one or the other or a mix of the two. Um, so what are these two classes? So they're constraint-based or score-based. Okay, so what are constraint-based approaches? Um, so they treat causal structure discovery as a constraint satisfaction problem. So they try to find the causal graph which satisfies as many as possible um, of the given um, constraints and the constraints in this case are conditional independence relations. Okay, score base is very different. Score, and, and sorry, I should say the most well-known um, example here is the PC algorithm, which probably many of you are familiar with. Um, the other class of algorithms are score-based approaches. Um, so here you take a particular score, for example, BIC, um, there are other scores as well that are um, consistent. And then what you try to do is you, okay, so BIC, so I mean, if I could enumerate all graphs, then okay, fine, I could just use the score. But you know, the, sp the space of all causal models is huge, even if you do this over just Markov equivalence classes, so you don't want to enumerate them. So usually what people do is a greedy search in this space. Okay, here, um, the most well-known example is probably this greedy equivalence search, this GS algorithm, which is a greedy search on the space of Markov equivalence classes. Okay, so maybe briefly, what are advantages and disadvantages on, of each class of models? So any of you who has applied them um, will know that for a given sample size, score-based approaches usually perform better than constraint-based approaches. Here, I just took some simulations um, from a paper um, from people at ETH. Um, and, and, you know, just showing here, for example, GS versus PC, they had also other algorithms in this paper. But anyone, and I'll have other simulations as well, anyone who has done this will see that, you know, score-based approaches for the sam same sample size usually perform better than constraint-based. So what is the intuition for this? Um, well, if you think about it, so how do constraint-based approaches work? So as I said, so the constraints usually correspond to conditional independence relations. Okay, and what they do is, you know, when you see a constraint, like a conditional independence relation, you re usually remove an edge. So, of course, if you, you know, the conditional independence relation, since they're estimated from data, there might be mistakes, right? So, you know, I might, assume, I might find that there is a conditional independence relation, although there shouldn't be one, and then I'm doing the mistake of removing an edge. And the problem is that you cannot correct mistakes. So mistakes just keep piling up. So in the end, I get graphs that have too few edges than what they should have. Whereas score-based approaches, because they're greedy, right? You know, even if I don't get the search direction completely right, you know, in the end, hopefully, I will, many times I can still find the optimum, although I'm not getting it right every time. So this greediness and of like going through the search space can actually help you quite a bit. And we looked at this um, in, a, in a geometric manner um, to understand this a bit better. Um, but of course, these constraint-based approaches also have a lot of advantages. Um, in particular, they're, you know, like they are set up, they're already a non-parametric, right? They just, um, they just, they're just based on conditional independence testing. So, you know, you can, for example, replace these conditional independence tests instead of looking at partial correlations, you can use um, kernels, for example, for estimating these, et cetera. Um, Score-based, you can also do this, um, but it's, uh, you know, you need to do an extra step. Usually people use um, BICs here, so this is usually like load based. 
Um, in addition, how greedy equivalent search is set up, and this I'll show you here. Um, as I said, it's a greedy search over the space of equivalence classes. Um, so it's, it's very smart in that, you know, I mean, it was a very hard proof to show, to do it, to actually define a greedy search um, in the space of Markov equivalence classes and not in the space of, of uh, causal graphs, but still the space is huge. And in fact, this is an open problem to know, like for n nodes, you know, how, how many Markov equivalence classes are there? But at least like here in this paper where they just enumerated them all, you see that already for, you know, 10 nodes, there are like 10 to the 19 many equivalence classes. Okay, so you're doing this greedy search on this huge search space. Okay, so what I would like to do is somehow overcome some of these problems. So as I said, so probably I would like to have a score based approach, I would like it to be non parametric. And if I can, you know, I would like it to overcome this uh, big search space question here. Okay, so that's um, what I'm going to propose as an algorithm. In addition, you know, this is all observational. As I said, I would really like it to work with interventional data. So I want it to be um, consistent with interventional data. So there also like what has been available in terms of with interventional data. Um, so there has been, and I'll have to reference uh, later on, there has been an interventional version of this greedy equivalence search, which is this G I E S. -S so I standing for um, interventional version. We proved that that approach is that, I mean, it was conjectured to be consistent. We proved it's not consistent. Um, and I can also give intuition for why it is not. Um, so there hasn't been any consistent approach available. So we'll prove that uh, whatever we're going to propose should hopefully be also consistent when you have interventional data, at least as the sample size goes to infinity, you really want to be able to find the correct interventional mark of equivalence class. Um, and then also I said with latent variables, what is available? Um, so there it's, I mean, there are also other approaches, but in terms of like with um, different kinds of consistency guarantees, there is usually just this FCI algorithm and many different kinds of versions of FCI, um, which is an extension of the PC algorithm. So in the latent setting, it's mainly constraint-based approaches. Of course, given what I said, right, that, you know, score-based approaches, at least when it's completely observational, usually perform better than constraint-based approaches. What you would really like to have is also a score-based approach that is provably consistent when you also have, when you have latent variables. Okay, so that's just a bit of an overview on, you know, causal structure discovery. Okay, so let me try to propose, and the intuition is super simple, let me try to propose an approach that is score-based. Um, it uses conditional independence relations, so it is non-parametric, and it overcomes this, um, it has a much smaller search space than, you know, just all Markov equivalence classes, and it will be consistent also with interventional data, and you can also turn it into an algorithm with latent variables as well. Okay, so um, how do you do this? Okay, um, so the intuition is super simple. Um, okay, so we want to learn DAGs. Um, so I'll just turn this problem of like thinking about learning a DAG into a different problem of thinking of learning and ordering of the variables and an undirected graph. Okay, that's good enough, right? Because if I give you an undirected graph and I tell you the ordering of the variables or a permutation, I will just orient all of the edges according to this permutation. Okay, so if one, if in this ordering, node A is smaller than node B and there is an undirected edge between A, B, I'll just orient it from A pointing to B. Because it's a DAG, this is good enough to do. Now the space of permutations, again, since we don't know how large the space of Markov equivalence classes is, um, because this is, there is no formula yet, but at least it seems to be much smaller. Um, of course, this needs to have a proof, but you know, at least on 10 nodes, it's like 10 factorial is much smaller than 10 to the 90. Okay, so how does this work? So I want to frame causal structure discovery as just a search over permutations um, because I want to argue that if I give you the correct permutation, it's actually very easy to find the corresponding DAG. Okay, and now comes here how I wrote down the Markov property before just to make it completely intuitive of like what we're going to do. So how do you associate to a permutation a DAG? Well, I'll take the permutation. This is an ordering and I'll just put an edge between two nodes when they are dependent given all the ancestors. Now in the Markov property, the ancestors are taken based on the graph, but of course we don't have a graph. So we'll just do the next best thing, which is just the ancestors in the ordering, right? You just take all of the nodes um, that are smaller in the ordering than these two nodes, I and J. Okay, so super intuitive way of doing it. Um, so in this way, I associate to every permutation a DAG, okay? And now what we showed here is that in fact, if you just choose 
So for every permutation, I have a DAG. If you just choose the ordering that gives you the sparsest graph, that's in fact the correct one. Okay, as the sample size goes to infinity. Um, so if you just choose the sparsest one, this is in fact equivalent to the, to the correct Markov equivalence class. Again, I don't have interventional data yet, but we'll do this. And I also don't have um, any latents yet, but we can extend all of this to that setting as well. Now, of course, there's a problem, right? So um, this is computationally a nightmare. I don't want to be enumerating all permutations and then just choosing the sparsest one. Um, so again, like for GES or these score-based approaches, I would like to do this greedy. Okay, I would like to walk around on the space of permutations and just, you know, greedily optimize um, this number, the sparsity of my graph. Um, and again, this is non-parametric, right? My score is just a number of edges. Okay, so how do you do this? Um, well, how does greedy search work on the space of permutations? Um, so the space of permutations is known. Um, if I just take the convex out, so, okay, so you view every one of your permutations. So here is a permutation of length four, okay, if I'm looking at four node graphs. So I look at all of my vectors, um, all of the orderings on length four, and I just take these vectors, line R4, I just take the convex hull of these. Um, in fact, that gives me a polytope. It's three-dimensional because the sum of all of these um, vectors is always constant, right? That's why you get a three-dimensional polytope. This is known, this polytope is known as a permutahedron. It has been studied a lot in discrete geometry. Um, so this is a general fact, okay? So if you take this, um, even for permutations of length P, you'll get a P minus one dimensional polytope, which is known as a permutahedron. Okay, so if I want to do greedy search on the space of permutations, well then, it's, I mean, very intuitive to just walk around on this polytope, right? So you just start in some random permutation, say this one here. I construct the corresponding DAG. Um, I look at how many edges it has. I look at all my neighbors. They also have corresponding DAGs. And I just walk to it if it has at most as many edges as where I am now. Okay. And so you walk around this polytope. Now, the hard thing to prove is that you don't get stuck. Okay that if I just do this greedy search, that in fact, every local minimum is a global minimum, and that's in fact the case, okay? So that's what we proved here. So again, under, under, under assumptions that are weaker than, than faithfulness is what you can prove here. So as the sample size goes to infinity, at least you're not going to get stuck. Okay, so you can actually just do greedy search on the space of permutations instead of the space of Markov equivalence classes. You can just use the super simple score function, which is just, you know, the number of edges in the corresponding DAG, and you have a provably consistent algorithm um, for causal structure discovery. Okay, so this is all just in the observational setting where, of course, there were all these other algorithms available before. Um, but just to show you how it works, I mean, we prove that it's consistent under strictly weaker conditions than faithfulness, and this is also what you see here. So usually it does perform better than, you know, something like a GES, or, and of course, what I've also shown before is that GES usually performs better than PC algorithms. Okay, so that's good. Um, in terms of can you scale it? Um, so here I'm stealing um, a picture from Frederick Eberhardt's talk. Unfortunately, this talk is not yet online. It's a super nice talk. I encourage you all to watch his talk here online. So I just took a screenshot of his um, slide. Um, so he has been working on um, neuroscience applications um, where of course he needs these algorithms to scale. And so we have our, our algorithm is implemented here in a Python package. Um, and so this is um, GSP here, this Python package. And so we were very happy to see that, first of all, others can use it, um, others that have not developed this. Um, and also that, you know, of course, it does not yet scale like these highly optimized, like fast GS algorithm or PC that is implemented in Tetrate, et cetera, which have many years of development just to actually speed them up. This is our first Python implementation, but we're already super happy that you can apply it to nodes with uh, graphs with thousands of variables. And also it's already faster than graphical lasso. So it's already faster than a Python implementation of actually learning an undirected graph, which I think is very nice. Um, so that's in terms of scalability, of course, like hundred thousands of variables is still difficult. Um, it needs to be super sparse if you want to do that, but thousands of variables does work. Okay, this is all observational. So in neuroscience, they have observational data. Um, so now what about interventional data in genomics? 
Um, okay, so interventional data, I, I told you there is this other algorithm, which is the interventional version of um, greedy equivalent search um, by Hauser and Bühlmann. It was conjectured it is, con it is consistent. We proved it is not consistent in this paper here. Um, so now how do you do this greedy sparsest permutation search? How do you do it interventional? It's actually also again completely intuitive. Um, so it is provably consistent, the hard interventions, soft interventions, even if you don't know the intervention targets. And maybe I give you some intuition of how it works because it's really completely intuitive. So let's just do the hard intervention setting. Um, so say I'm in some permutation and I'm wondering whether I should walk into this direction, this direction or this direction. Okay, so for hard interventions, so of course our, our score function is still just the sparsity, but I'm going to cut off some um, search directions. So I'm going to cut off search directions because for hard interventions, right, I already know that if I'm intervened on, there can be nobody pointing into me, right? Because I'm cutting off all of the incoming edges. Well, so if I'm looking here into this direction and I'm going to make a DAG where there is edges pointing into me and I'm an intervention, I already know I'm wrong. And in fact, you can prove that if you just cut off all of these search directions that will lead you to these kinds of graphs, you actually are still consistent. So you're going to end up in the correct mark interventional mark of equivalence class. Okay, so that's for hard. And then of course, there's a bit different inter, um, intuition for soft and unknown intervention targets. But it's, so it's nice that interventions help you in two different ways, right? They help you in terms of computation because you're, we're, you're cutting off search directions and it helps you in terms of identifiability because the interventional mark of equivalence class is smaller than, so you're, you're, you're able to identify more um, causal directions than you are if you just have observational data. Okay, now of course what happens with latent variables, right? Latent variables is kind of problematic if you do everything over search of, of permutations because latent variables introduces nodes that are uncomparable. Um, so we just recently um, showed that um, you can actually define the same thing as what we did up here. Instead of a greedy search over permutations, you now do a greedy search over post sets. Okay, post sets have this or partially ordered sets. So now I have certain nodes that are not comparable. This corresponds to latent variables. Um, so they can deal with latent confounders. We show this, this equivalent of this theorem here. The equivalent of this theorem is what we proved. So we proved that even when you have latent variables, the sparsest, so we again have a map from posets to these, in this case, mags, these uh, maximal ancestral graphs. So these are graphs with also bidirected edges. We show that the sparsest one is actually the true one. Now what we don't have yet is, so we do have a definition of a greedy algorithm, so greedy search over the space of post sets. What we don't have yet is this theorem that you never get stuck. So we applied it, so computationally, we've run it by now probably on 30,000 um, different kinds of graphs. We haven't found any counter, um, counter example, but we don't have the proof yet that you know every local minimum is a global minimum when you're doing a search over the space of post sets. Okay. So this is where we are for now. Um, again, I can show you some um, some um, evaluations. Um, so now let's just do the interventional setting. So since I promised, you know, what we look at is these knockout data sets. So this is, so later this year, there will be huge knockout data sets becoming available. For now, this is a knockout data set where you have knockouts on 30 different genes. Okay, so you have data on 20, so every sample is 20,000 dimensional, and you have samples where you knocked out gene one, gene two, gene three, up to gene 30. Okay, so 30 were chosen and they were knocked out. And you get to observe what happens um, when you do this. This is the standard SACS data set where you also have this on proteins, where you also have different kinds of interventional data on proteins. Um, okay, so how do you draw ROC curves? So this is what I was saying that we would like to predict the effect of an unseen intervention. So how we draw ROC curves is you leave out, so say I have observational data and interventional data, um, and I leave out one of the interventions. So let me do it for knockouts. So say I have interventions on genes one up to 20, I leave out the intervention for gene 20. Okay, so I use all of the interventions up to gene 19, plus the observational data, I try to learn a causal graph. And now in this causal graph, I want to see, you know, so now I look at, so I have intervention on gene 20. So I look at all of the edges um, neighboring gene 20. Um, if there is an edge pointing from gene 20 to gene 21, well then if I knock out gene 20, then I should see that the distribution changes on gene 21. If I do, 
well, if I have a, a tr an edge there and the distribution changes, then I call that a true positive. Otherwise, that's a false positive. Okay, so that's how you can actually draw ROC curves um, for how well you're able to predict the effect, how well you're able to estimate the graph. And you can do this also for the interventional. So here I do it for, uh, this is directed edges, this is skeleton without taking directions into account. This is again, I think skeleton without it, because then I can more easily draw what it is to do, do um, uh, random guessing. Okay, so what is it what you see? So ROC curves, you want to kind of be here and here, right? So what do you see here? So these uh, crosses are GIS, which we proved is not consistent. And the other two, as I said, IGSP is non-parametric, right? I can replace, instead of doing partial correlation testing, I can replace it by some kernel independence test, which you know is, is kind of helpful um, for, or often helpful for genomics applications. Although here it doesn't seem to, because we, just the sample size is too small, I think, for it to be helpful. But you see here nicely that, you know, when you have these kernel-based Test at least some, sometimes, or actually quite often, you actually do get the benefit um, of being able to do that, that instead of doing these partial correlation tests. So that's um, how these things work, and I think it's nice that we can actually start to evaluate um, these kinds of algorithms. Now, in terms of going forward, um, what are the important questions? I just wanted to put up one reference because I think this is like there is a whole lot of open questions in terms of experimental design, right? So what we did here is in all these algorithms, in all these methods, is we come up with algorithms that can take in observational data and interventional data, and they can learn the graph. But of course, you want to be able to ask, well, which intervention, I mean, in the end, I can choose, right? I, and this is one of the biggest questions that I'm asked um, when I work with people at the Broad, for example, well, which interventions should we do, right? Which interventions are the most helpful in order to actually learn the underlying causal graph the best way? Um, and of course, this is maybe a bit different than, you know, when you do these things um, for ads, because, you know, here, um, first of all, it costs a lot. I mean, one sample still costs about a dollar. So you have, you need to take budget constraints into account. Um, you also have time constraints. I mean, usually you're in the batch setting, right? I, you know, I cannot just do like one, I cannot just get one sample and then look at it and then decide on the next sample. Um, because it's in the end, it's like a postdoc or a student performing these experiments. So say you can maybe do four batches of experiments. And so the question is, which intervention should you do in order to learn the most about the underlying graph? And so I think here there is, I mean, we just have one paper here, a whole lot of assumptions that are not met um, that need to be, uh, that need to be relaxed. And I think this, this area here is still, you know, very, very widely open, um, this experimental design questions. Um, where I think it will be really great to get anyone's input. Okay, so that brings me back to the overview slide. Um, so what I talked about until now is just this first part on actually doing, um, trying to predict the effect of an unseen intervention from known interventions. And I was asked to stop somewhere in the middle. Um, it's not quite the middle, but I will stop here quickly and then I'll do the second part is much um, shorter. Great, thanks, Caroline. Uh, so we don't have questions in Q and A yet, but perhaps uh, can have one now. Um, so one question about your uh, your application. So how did you deal with statistical uncertainty? So if you, for example, if you resample, you expect you might get a different ordering. How would you aggregate across those? Or yeah. Uh, yeah. So we so when we apply it, really we we do a lot of stability selection kinds of applications. So yes, we always do that. So you, you actually subsample the data and then you look at the edges um, that are present uh, for many times, et cetera. So yes, here we didn't do it. I mean, but when we actually apply it to important questions, then we do it. Okay, great, thanks. I think also Hido has a question. You so, yeah, um, you, just the last part where you talk about uh, selecting interventions, are you focused that kind of mo mainly on, on trying to figure out what the, the graph actually is as opposed to kind of doing both exploration and exploitation like in multi-arm bandits and sort of more generally kind of does this connect to the the multi-arm bandit literature yep so that's um i think something we're working on right so here the question was what are the best interventions in order to figure out the underlying graph of course also there you have exploration exploitation right because um you know, at the beginning, you, I mean, anyways, you want to get first, first there 
there is so much uncertainty, you actually need to sample, get interventions in many different kinds of places and then, and then zone in. So this is a Bayesian approach that we're taking here. So it's, it's very similar to that literature. But if you go maybe a bit more in terms into maybe RL or something like that, of course there the goal is always to push your system towards a particular state. So I think those are the next questions that you know one wants to actually understand a bit better. It's not about learning the underlying graph, but maybe you know you have a particular state where you want to get to. Well, then maybe you shouldn't learn the full underlying graph in order to figure out what is the best intervention in order to push your state back to normal state if you're in the disease state, for example. Um, so yeah, so I, I think there's just you know this is like one little paper. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff to be done in this area. <laughs> uh, just just to encourage people to actually do it. This is uh, only for hard interventions. We have nothing for soft interventions. There's a yeah, whole lot of open questions. Yeah. Great, thanks. I think in the interest of time, we want to continue. Uh, so you have around 12 to 13 minutes left. Yep. That sounds perfect. Good. Okay. So now what about drugs? Um, so now I'm looking at the more, more conventional um, causal transport question where you know, I have an intervention in one setting, say one cell type, and I would like to predict its effect in a different cell type. Okay, so if you're a machine, so there is a whole lot of literature by Elias Barnbo and Judea Pearl, et cetera, and, co and collaborators on exactly this question in the graphical um, setting, right? Where, I have, where I'm assuming the graph is fixed and they actually have very, very nice line of work. And I think I have it uh, not written. Oh yeah, here. They have a, lot, a really nice line of work of actually finding necessary and sufficient conditions for exactly this. Okay, but I need to know the underlying graph and we know exactly you know, what are necessary and sufficient conditions on where the intervention is and where is the variables that are changing between different cell types so that I can actually do this transportability question. Now, if you're a machine learning person, I don't think this is the first way you would think about solving this problem, um, you will probably think about style transfer, right? So, you know, style transfer, I mean, they've been doing this for a long time, right? And it's super successful. So I have people in, in the neutral face and with a smiley face, and I try to, to generate the image of how this particular person would look like if he's smiling, right? And so how you do it is here shown like using an autoencoder. I first have all my, my data that I have. I all map it into the latent space so that, you know, I train this autoencoder so that it's good at reconstructing um, the data that I have, right? I map it into the latent space. And so now I just try to figure out, well, what is the direction from the data that I have? I figure out what is the direction that corresponds to adding a smile. And then I just move this vector over to this, oh sorry, here is the vector that I get. I move it over to this person here that I'm trying to make smile. And I just take this point and I map it back into the image space. And nicely enough, you know, this person actually comes out smiling. Okay, so this has been applied hugely, right? In, in machine learning for style transfer and images and in speech and all kinds of um, different applications. So the question is whether you could just do that to add a perturbation effect. Okay, so say, and in fact, I should say this was applied um, and it was applied here on two cell types and one drug. Okay, so say I have, um, so it's kind of, okay, this picture has four different cell types, but let's just say I have two cell types. I have, you know, this pink cell type here, I have its um, observational data and I apply a drug and I know what happens to it. And now I have a second cell type and I would like to know what happens if I apply this drug, okay? So I could map these three different populations into the latent space. I figure out what it means to apply the drug in the data that I have. I just move this, this vector over here and I just predict, oh, well, you know, maybe this happens. I map it back to expression space and I can actually do the experiment. And it actually worked kind of okay and well in this particular paper here. Okay, now I think this is quite surprising, in particular because, you know, there are necessary and sufficient conditions for doing this, right? So it's kind of surprising that this works. Also, if you think about it intuitively, I mean, this is like adding a smile is very different to trying to predict the effect of an intervention, right? Because smile is revertible, right? I mean, I can easily go backwards, but in an intervention, like if I'm in the interventional distribution, I need to figure out an intervention that actually puts me back into the observational state. And in general, there is no interventional distribution that just puts you back into the observational distribution. So it's very not revertible. Um, so, okay, it's quite, I think it's quite surprising that this actually worked. So we wondered whether this works more generally. And in particular for SARS-CoV-2 applications, we are looking at these very large scale drug screens. 
Okay, so this is the data where I'm going to apply it to. So here you see, this is again, everything is freely available, anyone can use it. So this is the CMAP data set from the Broad. Um, it has 1.2 million samples. These are again, gene expression samples. They this time live in 1000 dimensional space. And the data set contains thousands of different perturbations, knockouts, overexpression, and all kinds of drugs. Okay, for SARS-CoV-2, I'll be mainly face, uh, looking at these FDA approved drugs, but for now, let's just look at the data set. It's applied to hundreds of different, or about 100 different cell types, which you see here are colored. And the dark points inside are all of the perturbation data. Okay, so first of all, what you see is that the differences between cell types is much bigger than whatever a perturbation can do. Okay, so here, you know, all of these black dots are perturbations on these red dots. Okay, or here, all of these dots are perturbations on the orange dots. Okay, so this is the data set. So I would like to just test whether this works. Okay, because, you know, there are many drugs here. Of course, not every drug was applied to every cell type. So there's a lot of missing data, but there are drugs that have been applied to different cell types. Okay, so I'll just take the two cell types that have the most interventions and they are known as A549 and MCF7, whatever, these are just two cell types. I take the ones that have the most interventions and I just see whether, if I go back, whether in the latent space these vectors are aligned, right? This can only work if the vectors are actually aligned in the latent space. Otherwise, I cannot transport it by just doing this kind of nice vector arithmetics. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, I do this autoencoder business of embedding all of this data. I'm just going to look at the effect of these, um, these interventions and see if they're aligned in the latent space. Okay, so in the previous paper, what they used is the standard autoencoders. They go from, usually autoencoders are used for embedding into a lower dimensional space. So they go from, in this case, 1000 or 911 dimensional space to something smaller dimensional to something larger dimensional. That's the standard autoencoder. Now we have been for a, couple, for a year or two now interested in these um, strange autoencoders and I will motivate them. They actually do something which is very counterintuitive. We're actually going from a 911 dimensional space where these vectors lie in, we're going to go to a higher dimensional space. Okay, so the latent space is going to be higher dimensional. It's very unintuitive because, you know, a function that goes from this space to itself through a higher dimensional space, well, you would expect if it's just trained to, um, to match the images, right, to reconstruct the images, it could just be the identity map. Okay, if it was the identity map, this wouldn't help at all, right? Then the correlations in the original space and in the latent space should just be the same. But I'm giving you intuition for why, why we even did this here and why we expected it to work on the next slide. But what you see here is, this is the correlation. So if I take a drug in one cell type versus the other, right, same drug, and I look at its correlation in the latent, in the original space versus the latent space, when I do this over-parameterized business, whereas what happens when I do it in the standard autoencoder. Okay, what you want is, you know, these vectors should either be, you know, positive, positive or negative, right? Um, so what you see here, what happens with this autoencoder is that they're all pushed out, okay, to either plus one or to minus one. Um, so you have them be much better aligned um, in this latent space than in the original space. And in fact, much better than, you know, when you use the standard autoencoders, yes, it can help sometimes, but in many places it actually doesn't help at all to use these standard autoencoders. Now you can think, okay, I could do PCA, right? I could just take the first two principal components. Well, that would do the same. You would actually align the drug. So the first principal components are good directions. But of course, well, you're doing that at, you know, you're actually just throwing away a whole lot of data by doing that. Okay, so the over-parameterized autoencoder, you actually keep all of the data, right? Um, whereas, you know, in the standard autoencoders, you're also losing quite a bit of information. But here you keep all the data and you get all of your alignment, which is pretty nice, right? Here we just show that this also works when you look at all other cell types at the same time. Um, okay, so now I have what, five minutes? No, two minutes? Five minutes are fine, yeah. Okay, five minutes. So I just want to give you intuition for why this works. Um, so we have this work showing what is the inductive bias of, bi inductive bias of autoencoders, um, over-parameterized autoencoders. Okay, so if you go, so I'm going, I'm going through an over-parameterized, so a larger layer in the middle. Okay, so that means that I can definitely, so I have my training data, I can definitely reconstruct it. Okay, I can definitely train it to loss zero. 
So let's just look at points in R1. Say my images are in R1, okay? And an autoencoder goes from R1 to R1 through some lower, through some higher dimensional space in the middle. So it really learns a map from R1 to R1. So I can train it to loss zero. So definitely it is learning a function that is interpolating, right? So here I have examples. So say I have these three different training examples. So there are, there is one map is the identity map. Okay, that interpolates the data and you could expect maybe that the identity map comes out. We saw on the previous slide, that's not what is learned. Okay, but however, there are so many different functions that interpolate the data, right? I know I'll get loss zero, so it could be some crazy function like this. It could be this function that is learned. It could be some random other function. So the question is, what does gradient descent learn? Okay, so what does gradient descent learn when you're actually just trying to minimize reconstruction error? And so how we showed it, um, so what is the intuition for actually uh, seeing that it actually learns a map that is contractive at the training examples, it actually learns something like this. Um, how you see this is if, you know, what is nice about an autoencoder is I can just iterate the map, right? So it, it goes from RD to RD, well, just whatever comes out, let me plug it back in and I can just iterate the map. And if you do that and just apply it yourself, you'll see that whatever comes out is a training example, okay? Although if you do it once, then usually the training, if you're deep enough, the training example will already come out. But in general, the training example doesn't come out. But if you iterate the map, then in fact, one of your training examples comes out. Okay, so what an autoencoder does is, in this case, it actually gets back training examples through iteration. So it makes them more similar to training examples. And so that's where the intuition comes in, that when you use these over-parameterized autoencoders, they will actually align your drugs to the closest drugs, right? And hopefully these are exactly the ones that are in different cell types. So that's where the intuition came in for actually using this. Um, and it seems to work quite well, um, which is pretty nice here. Of course, there is something to prove, which we haven't proven yet. We have just applied it um, to the SARS-CoV-2. Um, of course, now you want to find the drug that is best aligned with the disease vector. That's exactly what we did, and I don't want to go through um, through the, the through the specifics. I mean, you just find the drug that is best aligned with it. You get a whole lot of list of drugs. You can again apply causal inference now to actually learn the graph, so that you can learn the mechanism of the of these drugs. Figure out which one you actually want to um, what to concentrate on. You definitely want to take a drug that has edges pointing out of it, right? Because it should change back the expression of these genes that are totally off. Um, and if you actually do that, you'll find out of all of this list of drugs, you'll find one, or we found one, um, that is exactly the one where we're now doing interventions on and has like very nice biological meaning actually. It's a very nice protein that we found here that seems to be related to aging, et cetera. And we of course all know that um, SARS-CoV-2 has a lot of inter intersections with aging. Okay, with that, let me end. So I talked about two different causal transport problems, one between interventions, one of an intervention between different populations, in this case, cell types. And I think it is super important to actually have a principal causal framework when you're thinking about drug discovery because a drug is an intervention. If you want to pr um, predict the effect of a drug or choose drugs, uh, I think one needs to have a principal causal framework for doing that. And with that, let me end um, this, um, work wouldn't have been possible without really an amazing group of people, collaborators, and then of course, a lot of funding from different sources. And thank you all for listening. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Caroline. Uh, so uh, we'll now uh, take some more questions from the audience. Uh, we're gonna do that slightly different than usual. So I will uh, stop the recording now.